Hello guys, welcome to Psych and Law and let's get ourselves started. This is our first lecture for the course. Uh, lecture one, part one, there'll be a lecture one, part two, duh, right? And uh, what we're gonna start off with is just kind of ease ourselves into it and kind of an overview and a discussion of the dilemmas. This is also, uh, one thing I've done is embedded the homework assignments in the lecture. So as we're doing the lecture, we can go ahead and talk about the assignments and how they fit together. It's a model that worked pretty well last semester, so I'm kind of continuing it and, and hopefully refining it. Now, uh, when we do the in-person thing, and I so miss teaching in person, and, and I imagine a bunch of you miss being in class in person, I get to ask questions, and, and then people get to shout out, and we get to have some kind of fun like that, and it's not something we can do, but uh, I'm going to try and maintain that flavor. So as you're sitting out there in the room, and you're taking psych law, psych and law the natural thing to do is, is ask you, what do you want to be? And I know it's a silly question, right? This is a question you ask children, but, but you know, for I think young adults, uh, and you're certainly uh, emerging adults, then what do you want to be? And, and, you know, do you want to be a lawyer? Does anyone want to be a cop? How about uh, a clinical psychologist? And, and we know since this is offered by psychology department, then there's probably more than one of you that want to be a clinical psychologist. Right? Uh, maybe, does anyone want to be a profiler? That is a criminal uh, investigative an analyst, right? Uh, you know, or, or maybe your needs are a little different than that. May, maybe you're just taking the class for credit. God, I got to get three more credits. And that's okay if you're here for that because you're going to get them, right? Uh, or maybe are you working on some deep-seated evaluation problem? And, and if not, if you are, maybe we don't even, even want to hear about that, right? Or, or maybe, maybe it's simpler than that, right? Or, or are you just fascinated by crime, criminals, police, and or punishment, right? And, and let's run through some wacky images here. So on the next two slides, we'll run through some wacky images, and we'll just hear this clicking them off, right? So that last image of the SWAT team member pointing the rifle at you, that was taken from the Lima, Ohio uh, SWAT team police page. Uh, it seems they had a problem years ago. They went into the wrong house and then they shot a grandmother uh, mistakenly. And uh, the, the interesting thing is this picture is actually a GIF that had muzzle flash and it was pointing directly at someone in bad taste. You don't point a gun at anyone. The range master in me comes out, Mr. Safety, right? One of my proudest accomplishments when I was the range master and general manager at Angela Shooting Range is we went five years with tens of thousands of customers, right? Every year, we have five years without an accident, without an injury. Uh, and, and safety systems can be designed to prevent accidents. Uh, safety's always been an interest of mine, so. And, and uh, maybe the, some of these people. So we're gonna talk about a lot of interesting folks and uh, it's a tough course because a lot of this is just heinous stuff that we have to talk about. But we don't necessarily <laughs> want to live our life being dragged down into a morass of despair that, that we in fact got to lighten it up sometimes. So uh, if I'm, I'm dancing back and forth between heavy and light, I understand I think it's probably psychologically healthy if we're able to do that. But at the heart of the law, the law attempts to resolve conflict. That's what it's about, right? The, uh, core aspect of the law is attempts to resolve conflict. The law is in a constant state of tension between the rights of individuals and societal good, right? And, and it's, it's this tension that becomes the fascinating and represents a dilemma for us. Now, the law is viewed differently by actors in the legal system, right? And, and the big question then is, who are the actors and at this point in time, I would open up the floor. You guys would be raising your hand, shouting it out, and I'd be writing these actors on the board if we were in a room that had a board and wasn't taken up by the whole screen or what have you. But let's think about who those actors are. I mean, there's law enforcement. There's legal professionals. There's district attorneys. There's defense attorneys. There's public defenders. There's uh, Congress people. There's senators. There's criminals. There's the civilians. There's jailers. The prison warden. Right? All these people are actors 
that participate within the legal system and the legal process. And that's an incomplete list. There's far more than, than what I've listed, right? But the idea, the take-home point there is people view what the legal system is for and how it should operate. They view it differently based on their role within the legal system. And who was the one that kind of illustrated to us the importance of role? A social psychologist, famous social psychologist, did a prison study, a mock prison study. Anyone remember this guy's name? Hey, Quincy. We have a lot of visitors that come and visit us. Quincy is the master of the house. He's the big boy. We got 16 and a half pounds cat here. He is definitely bigger than anyone else. So expect throughout the lectures to get a lot of visitors, Quincy being one of them here. All right. So who are the actors and they view things differently? Well, I don't know if Quincy's an actor in the legal system, but if he was, his view would be uh, as good as anyone else's. Now, let's talk about this. Also, at the, at the heart of interpretation of what the law is and what the law should do, right, is a fundamental question. Is the Constitution of the United States to be maintained as a vision of the Founding Fathers? And a strict constitutionalist should say, yes, the Constitution was a brilliantly written document. The Founding Fathers, Jefferson, Adams, uh, Payne, uh, all, all these guys, right? These guys had it together. They knew what was going on, and they were able to write a document that will lead us through 260 years and another 260 years beyond. Hail, all hail the Constitution. So we, we talk about the, the most extreme view of this is being constitutionalists, right? But what exactly does that mean then? How does that play out? And, and that's an interesting question in and itself. But the, the other view, right, is should the law be interpreted in the spirit to guide us through new and therefore unforeseen conflicts that that the constitution is not a literal document but is a document that sets the stage or sets the tone for how we evaluate new circumstances and and the constitution should be somewhat flexible and adaptable to unanticipated issues right one thing i hope to do throughout the course is to be fair and balanced that is to actually present both sides of an issue right you don't need me to tell you what to think now part of my role is to help you to learn how to think that's the educational process and we think in terms of critical thinking we'll have a, a, a lot of assignments that gear towards that but not what to think not what political philosophy to uh, and, and let me declare my bias right now do you believe that any of your teachers are unbiased? Uh, probably not, right? Every, every human being has some level of bias. I tend to be on the liberal side, central to liberal, depending, depending on, on what the issue is, right? And, and that's kind of my stance. So if you detect bias, at this point you should say, oh, yeah, Mark, you know, he's just biased and he's saying that, but uh, there are other point of views. My Hopefully, I have a high level of skill in presenting both sides. Uh, that doesn't mean that I have to then be devoid of an opinion. Certainly, I will have my opinions. But critical thinking demands, and, and I think my role of standing in front of a class demands that I am able to present and acknowledge both sides and also develop assignments that allow you to do the same. Right? So, now... What about the law? Is, I said the law was about resolving conflicts, but is that true? I mean, do we resolve conflicts, or should the law step in and enforce what might be called the moral order, or, or determine what is right or wrong, and then enforce on that basis? And, and we get into some areas where these questions become more... Obviously the law should intervene when someone commits a murder you know the law should be designed to do something about that but should let's say employees be should it be okay for employers to fire employees for smoking now i'm talking cigarettes here right because let's face it cigarettes waste time I was a smoker for maybe 30 of my 63 years. I haven't smoked in, in 10, 12 years. I finally kicked it for good, right? But, you know, when I was a smoker, let's say when I was working at the paper mill, 
you know, you can't smoke inside the paper mill. That was not allowed, right? And, and so you would have to go outside. Well, if I'm outside, I'm not at my desk doing my job, right? And then what happens when the paper mill says you can't smoke on the premises at all? Then I would leave. Unfortunately, I have salaried. I would walk down to the river and go stand on a rock, you know, at the edge of the river and say, I am not on mill property. I'm in the river and I'm smoking, but I'm not doing my job during that time. Could I be fired? And let's face it, smoking, what? causes potential health problems and raises then the likelihood that I will avail myself of insurance or have a, a greater proportion of time off. Should the employer be able to terminate me on that basis? Uh, uh, and then, but other questions like enforcing the moral order. What about same-sex marriage? Should there be a law prohibiting same-sex marriage or, or civil unions or neither? And note that these are questions that I asked when I first started teaching this class in 2004. And that's I've left these questions up on purpose because times have changed. Times have changed in that brief span that I've been teaching this class. It makes these questions even more interesting. What about medical or legal marijuana? Think about it. When I first started talking about this, there was a state or two that had medical marijuana and, and one or two states that had legal marijuana, and that was it. Right? And now we see a tremendous number of states, over half the states have medical cannabis, and many states have legal retail level recreational marijuana sales. Okay? Interesting thing, I was growing up, I graduated from high school in 75, and I remember back then people were saying, oh, weed's going to be legal in a year or two in 1975. <laughs> Uh, those people uh, were not quite right. This is Annika, by the way. Annika is a frequent visitor, right, sweetie? Did you come to help lecture? All right. Now, what about right to choice versus right to life? And notice, balanced. What I'm trying to do, right to, right to, right? So I'm not shaping these as a positive versus a negative. It is the right to, the right to. So uh, what about religious sacraments? Should people be allowed to use drugs that are normally illegal if they're the basis of the religious sacrament? What happened during prohibition to the Catholic Church, right, when you want to do communion? What about the sacramental wine? Should that be allowed? No, alcohol is prohibited. I don't care if you're a Catholic or not. Or if you're a Native American and you want to take peyote as part of your ritual to become closer to your deities, should you be allowed to do that? Should Native Americans be allowed to participate in peyote rituals when peyote is illegal for the rest of the people? What about the Rastafarians? They were always fighting for the use of cannabis, right? And, and they never sold the idea to the Congress to allow it. Now, Native Americans do have the right to cultivate peyote and use it for their religious ceremonies. Rastafarians did not get the right to cultivate cannabis and use it for their religion. More recently, the Santo Daima religion has gained approval to use ayahuasca as part of their religious ceremony. The main ingredient in ayahuasca, the, the psychoactive component, is DMT. If you or I were just to take DMT or have a little bag of DMT powder, we might be up for a seven-year uh, holiday in a federal pen, whereas if you're Santo Daima, you're allowed to use it for your religious ceremonies. So is that something the government should even be involved in? What is the law for? What it would be the conflict there, right? So these are actually issues of the moral order. And, and see, when we look at our relationship to the law, much of the law rests on the initial assumptions of what the law should do. So when we want to kind of do our own little gut check, our own little introspection, we can ask ourselves, we can think about it, we can become more explicit in our understanding of what we believe the law to be, what we believe the law should be doing. And notice, when you get to people's underlying assumptions, it can give you an awful lot of information about how they will, uh, what their opinion will be on issues as they're presented to them. Now these assumptions then, we might ask the question, and I would do this obviously, we would ask this question and do a big list on the board, where do these assumptions come from? Well, since I can't get the feedback from you, I'm going to offer you some examples. What should the law do? The initial assumptions probably come to us from our parents, right? Most of what we know about the world as children is the result of our parents communicating it to us. But then, you know, the assumptions can come, we, we learn from the church 
the temple, the mosque that we go to. We learn from school. We learn from each other. So understanding where we develop these assumptions, what were the sources, right? So let us move forward then to the four dilemmas. Let me warn you that the four dilemmas are fair game throughout the course. So on any quiz or any assignment, I might incorporate a question about or a discussion of the four dilemmas. Now, you don't need to know them by number. You don't know, oh, you know, the quiz question is not dilemma one is what? No, it, it's more the application of the dilemmas, if you will. So, the four dilemmas then really represent the goals, the tension, the views, right, that we are looking at within the legal system. What are the four dilemmas? And I'm going to flesh each one out, so let's just get our list first, and then we'll take them one at a time. We already discussed one. Is the law, one of the dilemmas for the law is protecting individual rights versus securing the common good or common safety, if you will, right? We also have this issue of equality versus discretion. How should people be treated? Should the law treat everyone equally, or should the law possess some flexibility, offer discretion? Third dilemma. Is the law, and especially within the court context, do we have a trial to discover the truth? Or is the trial more or better envisioned as simply resolving a conflict, either between two people or between a person and the state, if you will. And then one of the big ones for us, right, and for, for many of us at, at Ohio State, we are extremely well-versed or will become extremely well-versed in the science and the scientific method, right? But what's more important, opinion or scientific findings? And how does that relate to the law? More on that in a couple minutes. So let, let's, let's attack the first dilemma first. Individual rights versus the common good. Well, right off the bat, we talked about assumptions and where do your assumptions come from. One of the big assumptions comes to us from a hidden hand called culture. Now, Dick, Bizet, Dick Nisbet is a famous social psychologist. And he gave us a talk at OSU Social Psychology, uh, one of our colloquium meetings. And there's about 60 of us in the room. And, and I remember Nisbet is going to open up his talk on cross-cultural psychology. And he said, before we get started, just a, a fun little question. Does a fish know it's wet? And we're all like, yeah, well, that's really stupid. Who cares? But when you reflect on that question, that is, and I got fish. Anyone got fish? I got three different aquariums right in the fish. And I asked the fish. I, said, I looked at the fish, and I said, hey, dude, do you know you're wet? And he's like, what the hell else would I be? What else is there? And note that a fish doesn't even realize it's wet until... Yeah, and sadly, if you take it out of the tank and put it on the floor, then it's going to know that it wants to be wet, right? So culture is this hidden hand that shapes our ideas. Now, the individual rights versus common good, right? I ask, what's more important, individual rights or common good? One of the chief indicators how a person will answer that question is their cultural assumptions or underpinnings. Collectivist societies will lean towards the idea of maintaining the common good, right? Whereas individualistic societies tend to come down on preferring the sanctity of individual rights. But obviously there's exceptions, culture, does, you know, there's still individuals within a culture, but kind of as a global idea. There's more tension, though, in the individualistic society surrounding this question than the collectivist society. We in the individualistic society, like the United States, have a, a, a greater potential for debate, right, in this question uh, than people from the collectivist society probably would be. And, of course, then we would discuss this. We would say, why might that be? And anytime I ask one of these questions, if you want to contemplate it, obviously, what can you do? You can frickin' pause me. You can shut me off, and you can contemplate the question. Right, Quincy? He's really hanging out with us today. So this leads us, then, 
to looking at the legal system and, and two models that, that demonstrate themselves in the criminal justice system. Now, the due process model is characterized by the Warren Court, the, and what we're saying is Warren was a Supreme Court justice during this period of 1953 to 69, uh, from the an Eisenhower administration, right, through uh, 69 would be through LBJ for the most part, and then the Burger Court from 69 to 86 uh, would be the Nixon courts. And, and basically what they're saying is that the emphasis should be on protecting individual rights. Right? So we give people due process and we ensure their access to attorney, that their rights are read to them, that we protect through due process the individual from a government gone bad or a government gone authoritarian that that the state is all powerful and can crush people so we need to crush i mean we need to protect these individuals from the potential overzealous government right so that represents a due process model that's really about ensuring that people's rights are maintained now the crime control model on the other hand is characterized by the Rehnquist court that comes up during the Reagan era. And what we see with Rehnquist is, no, that the law is first and foremost about controlling crime. So the due press process model then is, is the protection of the citizens, individuals from law enforcement personnel. And, and the general assumption is if law enforcement personnel is left to their own devices, they will come down way too hard on folks far more than they need to. Right? So the due process model says the individual needs protection from the justice system. Okay? Individual rights then become primary to this. And the mantra that I'm sure most of you have heard is it's better to let 10 guilty go free than one un innocent person punished unjustly. Okay. And, and, and this can sound really good, you know, that, that we have to protect people. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be point, appointed to you at no expense, right? And, and so the Miranda rights are an example of due process. Now also we stress the Supreme Court justices because they're kind of the overall tone of the court over that period of time. So that's why it's important to talk Warren Court versus Rehnquist Court and, and then look at them as crime control versus due process entities. So. Illinois overturning the death penalty because of mistakes is an example of a due process decision. That is, it was found that folks were, in fact, being prosecuted unjustly, that there were people on death row that, in fact, did not get a fair trial and may, in fact, not be guilty of the crime. Uh, it's so Illinois said, look, you know, e even one mistake is, is one mistake too many. We can't afford to make mistakes when it's coming to the ultimate penalty of putting people to death. So they say the death penalty, we're just going to take it off the table, as many states in the, in, in the country have. So the crime control model. Well, it's a little different. Protection of society as a whole becomes the emphasis, right? Safety and security are what are needed, and, uh, you know, if we step on some individual's toes, then so be it, as long as society in itself is protected. And we see a bunch of examples of laws like Terry versus Ohio, which means that a police officer can pat you down if they believe that you might represent a threat. A warrant isn't needed, just officer safety is enough to trigger a pat down, right? Uh, three strikes and you're out in California. What they said is, hey, if you commit two violent felonies and, and, and go to prison, then if you commit a third crime, even a misdemeanor, then you're going to be put in jail for life on the basis of that third misdemeanor. It was a response to what was perceived as a revolving door justice system. That is, people were getting out and they were reoffending. So this was an idea to stop the reoffending, thus protecting society to a greater extent, but arguably trampling on the rights of the individuals in question. 1020 Life in California was another response. And notice, these come in the 90s, and we were on a get tough on crime uh, kind of emphasis. So. 
1020 life, if you use a, a weapon in a crime, you can have 10, 20 years added to your sentence right off the bat for using a weapon in that crime. And then finally, Megan's Law, New Jersey. Oh, not finally, but next to last, a penultimate, if you will. Megan's Law, New Jersey, that is that if uh, we, we can inform people in the neighborhood of released sex offenders because Megan Kanka was kidnapped and murdered by a released sex offender. And then uh, again with the sex offense, sexually violent predator classification, Kansas versus Hendricks, what happened? Hendricks was ready to get out of prison, and he's ready. I served my time. And as Hendricks is walking out of prison, they say, well, you know what? You're not going to leave prison and go out into the community. We're actually going to put you in a state mental hospital now. And he says, you can't. I served my 20 years. And they said, well, but the thing is, you've been classified as sexually violent predator while you were in prison, and that means that now we remit you to a mental health facility until the psychologists say you're no longer a threat to society. And Hendricks argued back, well, that's double jeopardy. You tried me for a crime. I paid my time. I'm done, right? And, and which is a legitimate argument, but the state came back and said, no, you still represent a present danger to society, so we're going to keep you in a mental hospital. And he says, you can't punish me twice. And he said, well, we're not punishing you. We're putting you in a mental hospital for treatment. Although, it was acknowledged there's no successful treatments available to sex offenders. So, uh, but regardless, most states now have a sexually violent predator classification that can add time to your sentence or release you to a mental hospital or prevent your release whatsoever. And we know that Megan's Law, what do we have? Sex offender notifications and such. Well, okay. Uh, hang on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut here and, and then I'll bring it back. My camera only allows for about 24 minutes, so uh, 25 minutes, uh, so I need to stop. It'll all be spliced together. It'll be fine. Hello, everybody. Part two here. So we're talking about the crime control model versus the due process model and how that relates to the first dilemma. I want to extend this discussion. Oh, by the way, if you hear some dinging and donging in the background, uh, right outside that window, uh, I'm on the th third floor here, but still right outside that window on my neighbor's porch, Jim's porch, he's got some pretty heavy-duty wind chimes, and it's pretty breezy today. So if you hear some donging, it's probably the wind chimes. Hopefully, we'll be spared the Dukes of Hazard stupid ass horn on my dumbass's neighbor on the other side. That was going off all day yesterday. Uh, I, got, I got more to say about him as, as the course unfolds. Now, we talked about the crime control model, and, and in the late 80s and then into the 90s, crime was increasing. And, and so the response quite often when we believe that society is spinning out of control, that it's becoming more dangerous, forces find it necessary to clamp down. And, and that is really represented by the efforts of the crime control model through the 1990s. Now, beyond that though, we have some really pernicious shit happening, and that is the terror control model. So really, post 9-11, Right? What happens? Well, the terror is perceived to be out of control. And as a result, we have to combat terror, right? So it relies on people's fears and, 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 and the news media, which is one of the actors in the legal system, communicates this danger and ramps up people's fears so they'll support more and more punitive uh, responses to norm and law violators. So with the terror control model, what did we see occur? Well, right, we see intense scrutiny of all citizens. And as a result of the terror control model in our post 9-11 world, I hope you understand this, that all of your electric electronic communications are stored in giant fusion centers, uh, especially in, in Utah. And so we're being monitored all the time. There's cameras everywhere. All our electronic communications, cell phone, email, whatever it is, chats, can all be accessed and stored as a result of the response to terrorists in 9-11, in right? So this constriction of rights to due process, that is, I don't need a warrant to get your material anymore, or I don't need to present you with the warrant. 
I can go to special FISA court, which is on the down low that no one knows about, and I can get stuff and do these secret investigations outside your awareness. So some of your due process has been eroded as a result of the terror control model. When I was a kid, and when I was a teenager, and when I was a young adult, if you want to go to the airport, you went to the airport. And you could walk right up to the gate and say goodbye to your friends getting on the plane. You know, and then, when, then they put in magnetometers because planes were getting hijacked all the time. So they wanted to check for weapons. So we go through the magnetometer. That was it, right? But now, what does the TSA do? I mean, the scrutiny is amazingly intense. Now, here's the deal. And again, this comes from your assumption. Some people say, applaud the TSA. Yeah, this is good that they're doing this because they're keeping us safe. Other people are saying, this is a most, most invasive process that really is destroying my rights. Again, different opinions on this, right? So now, from a scientific basis, I look and say, what is the cost of the TSA and their work and what do they actually detect? And what we've seen is when the TSA is put to an empirical test, they have about a 95% failure rate on detecting weapons when they're being tested. So you might like it in theory, and that's fine. You say, well, we should, we should make, you know, search everyone and be diligent. But when we're spending our money, we should also stand back and say, but is it effective? Is it doing the job? Is it doing what it was designed to do? And we have an assignment that's going to kind of touch on that as well. So we have intense spending on programs with no evidence of their utility and, and really no evidence uh, of their need, right? Uh, was it a one-up, 9-11? Uh, for the most part, it appears to be, right? Uh, and, and today is, I'm doing this lecture, today is January 8th. I just witnessed something the uh, Two days ago, I, I couldn't even work because I was glued to the TV watching insurrectionists take over the Capitol building. If we want to talk terror control model, we had terrorists take over the Capitol building of the United States and then just freely walk out. So this becomes very problematic, and it's something when we talk about discretion and equality, I think it's something that we can converse. And, and yeah, some of the stuff that we talk about in this class is topical and it's controversial. So now I want to talk about the war model, and this one, this one is, for me, truly scary. Right? Uh, 40 years of the war on drugs, maybe 50 years. Nixon began the war on drugs, right, because drugs were the scourge, and we're going to conduct this war on drugs, and we're going to eliminate drugs from society. And we dump this huge amount of money. We take away increasingly individual rights or erode protections of due process so that we can win this war on drugs. But the funny thing is, 40 years later, there's been no change. 50 years later, there's been no change. There's been no change in drug use. There's been no change in the prevalence of drug, drugs. So at some point, when you make these changes, you have to say, if it's not working, is this something we should continue? But more insidious, I believe, is the war, and that's why I have it in quotes. We've seen countless dollars spent, countless lives ruined, no change in drug use or the desire to use drugs, and at least 800,000 people, closer to 1.2 million people now, in prison, costing us a tremendous amount of money for drug use or engaging in the business of selling drugs which if there's a demand, someone's going to try and fill that demand through selling. So the problem is the term, uh, uh, oh, asset forfeiture. There's a, another great feature. What, uh, what is asset forfeiture? That is, if it's believed that you have acquired possession through illegal means, the police have the right to seize that, take it away from you, and eventually it becomes the police departments, which is a strange thing because it incentivizes the police to take people's property for financial gain. Some people think that's a line that's been crossed that shouldn't have been crossed. Again, it's a matter of opinion. We also have no-knock warrants with the fear that people might flush their drugs down the toilet or respond violently. Now police can just kick in the door, and this has been proven to be a disaster because 
people are getting shot, right? In Pima, Arizona, what do we have? We have a SWAT team go in with a no-knock warrant, right? They bust in the door. A woman op wakes up her husband and says, Honey, someone's in the house. I heard something. And, and Honey happens to be a veteran. He happens to be a soldier. And he happens to have a civilian legal AR-15, the civilian version of the weapon that he used while he was a soldier, and he goes to protect his home. As soon as he appears with the AR-15, the SWAT team shoots him dead in his own home. Problem is, there was no drugs. So the SWAT team bursts into a man's home. Is your home your castle? He goes to defend his home, and he's killed. And of course, what happens? Well, they find that the bust, that the, the going in was not supported legally. And now, the city of Pima, Arizona has to pay the family $6 million. These costs are huge. We have a cost of life, and then we have a cost in, in money. And it's not the police department that paid him $6 million. It's you and I that paid the family six million dollars for the police's mistake. Is this something that should be done in the first place? Is this something that's actually necessary? And I, what we're going to talk about in future assignments is kind of a cost-benefit analysis on, on a lot of these laws. So what we have seen is the militarization of police departments uh, and if we go back to when I was growing up in the 1960s, this was something that was a no-no. This was something that was against. Law enforcement is civilian. It's not military. So when we start equipping law enforcement and putting them in fatigues and putting them into armored cars, is it now the cliche of the Los Angeles Police Department? Remember Adam 12 or Dragnet to protect and to serve? Are these people protecting and serving or are these people uh, arming and dominating? What is the relationship of the, of the civilian to the police and how has it changed over time? And with the war model, then think about it. If the police are at war, who are they at war with? And they're at war with us. And is that the way we want to position ourselves towards each other? Right? These, these ideas can be tremendously problematic. So we have 12 years of the war on terror, you know, 40, 50 years of the war on drugs, a war on crime. As soon as we call it a war, we're changing the nature of what we're doing. Now, will it always be this way? Does it just get worse and worse? Not necessarily. And, and if we look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg, please rest in peace, she was asked about the rise of the so-called post-truth world, which is where we live now. The truth no longer exists or matters, right? People lie about everything and treat those lies as if they're reality, right? I'm optimistic in the long run. A great man once said the true symbol of the United States is not the bald eagle. It's the pendulum. And when the pendulum swings too far in one direction, it can do nothing but swing back. And if we look historically at the crime control model and the due process model, what we see historically is we get tough on crime, and then we go too far, and then we begin to find ways to protect individual rights. So in fact, we do see this pendulum that swings back and forth as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is suggesting. And here's just a little image for you. I don't know if any of you are Edgar Allan Poe fans. I've loved Edgar Allan Poe since I was a child. And there is one story called The Pit and the Pendulum. And so anytime someone says pendulum, it triggers the image of the pit and the pendulum. And I don't know if the pendulum is a cool metaphor or not. Right? So, had enough first dilemma? Let's move on to the second dilemma. Equality versus discretion. Equality, pretty simple to define. Same consequences for the same crime. So anyone who commits a crime gets the same sentence. You commit a bank robbery, and we call bank robbery 30 years, boom. Circumstances don't matter. You rob a bank, 30 years. You rob a bank, 30 years. You rob a bank, 30 years. Equality across the board. Problem is, circumstances might differ. And we might want the flexibility to say, well, in this case, not so serious, in this case, more serious, and, and then tailor the punishment to more fit 
the magnitude of the severity of the crime in a given circumstance. So equality, same consequence, right? And proportionality is, is a, a sub-issue here. That is magnitude offense in proportion to the magnitude of the punishment. That there should be some kind of, uh, that shoplifting might be worth six months. Right? And bank robbery should be worth 20 years because one is proportionally or significantly <laughs> greater in magnitude as a threat to society than, than, than another. Uh, now, discretion allows flexibility in the application of the law. And a lot of times people argue against discretion because, well, the thing is with discretion, hey, the wealthier you are in our society, the less time you're going to serve. And, and so, you know, socioeconomic status is, is one place that challenges the notion of discretion. That, hey, if you're rich and you can lawyer up, you're going to have a shorter sentence than someone who's poor and has insufficient representation, right? Now, because discretion was viewed in the press as allowing unequal outcomes, then the response was for legislators to pass laws that created mandatory sentences. So mandatory sentences co combat the sentencing disparity. And this is what we call determinate sentencing, as I first gave you the example. Bank robberies, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, period. And don't tell me about circumstances or consequences or anything else. Uh, that crime is worth that amount of money or that amount of time. But what we find, unfortunately, is that historically, if you eliminate discretion, that is, you don't allow the judges to say two years or 20 years as they're reviewing their sentencing guidelines, the judge has got his hands tied and they say 20 years, 20, 20, 20 years, then the judge has had their discretion power taken away. But in Taming the System, written by Dr. Samuel Walker, he advances the notion that discretion doesn't go away, it just shifts to another person. So if you take the discretion away from the judges, then you see more discretion, let's say, in, in the prosecutors and the district attorneys, and it increases the discretion in, in law enforcement, let's say. When I was growing up, in California, possession of cannabis was a felony. Two-year sentence. So imagine that if you were caught with a joint, a single marijuana cigarette, then and convicted, you'd go to prison for two years with felony. Well, in the 1970s, people are saying that's a little too harsh, right? So what do you see happen? Well, sometimes police officers would, in fact, interact with a teenager, find a joint on them, and say, wow, if I arrest this person, they may be going to prison for two years. Uh, and I can't really support that because I just don't believe it's that serious. So what I'm going to do is just make the teenager turn it up, uh, tear it up, and throw it on the ground. I'm just going to take it away from them, scare them, and send them on their way. And you say, well, that seems like a realistic response, right? The problem is, what we find, though, is if it's a white middle-class teenager, yeah, they tear up the joint and tell them to throw it away. But if it's a black teenager, they arrest them and take them to prison. So this is, this is why we call these dilemmas. This is why, the, because there's no easy answer, right? It's, you know, the old saying, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And that's why they're dilemmas, and that's why they're, they're important to understand. So discretion points, well, the judge's sentence. But if you take discretion away from the judge's sentencing, then maybe the police will arrest or not. Or the prosecutors can charge or not. The police may arrest, but then the prosecutor decides not to press charges and just release the person, right? Prosecutors can also charge for a lesser crime. They have that. So in fact, you know, you might be caught with a marijuana cigarette and they say, well, we won't want you to do two years. We would think a fine is more appropriate. So we're just going to uh, charge you with disturbing the peace. And, and they can do that, right? Uh, governors and presidents can grant clemency and pardon. Uh, I don't even want to talk about 
president's granting pardons right now. Uh, so let's move on from there. And juries can nullify. And this is something we'll talk about later in the course as well. That is a jury can simply just not go there. And in the 1970s, we saw a lot of juries in a lot of states when they were sitting on marijuana cases, just find defendants not guilty. Defendants who are clearly guilty, here's the witness, here's the evidence, and the jury would just say, we're not going to go there, not guilty. Right? Uh, and, and juries do have that power. So, Enough of the second dilemma. Let's move on to the third dilemma. Remember we asked the question, is the law about discovering the truth or resolving conflict? Well... Different systems of justice have different assumptions about this. Now, our system of justice in the United States is the adversarial system. We love combat. There's a book on understanding global cultures through metaphor, and, and they liken America, the United States, to a football game. We like to see two teams come out on the field, hit each other hard, and then one team wins and the other team loses, kind of like our court system. The two parties come in, they present their sides, right? The judge is merely a referee that, that only calls penalties for procedural errors, right? Uh, procedural malfeasance. And, and they fight it out and they fight it out and then the, and then the jury determines who's the winner or, or the judge if it's a trial by judge. The truth doesn't enter into this. No one's trying to discover the truth. Each side in the adversarial system is just trying to present the most compelling case so that they win. Now, if you go to Europe, you see a shift to the inquisitorial system. The judge plays a far more active role. The judge can question people, right, which is not something that happens in the adversarial system, right? So the judge kind of runs the show in the inquisitorial system, and their ultimate goal, at least in principle, is to uncover the truth and make a decision based on that. But... In the United States, we feared the inquisitorial system coming out from underneath the thumb of King George. That is, we don't want an agent of the state, a judge, right, having that level of power. We want an even fight between defense and prosecution. Advantages to both systems, right? Now, adversarial system may provide incentives for attorneys to dig deeper, but at the same time, they may cheat, they may conceal information, right? Adversarial systems may increase the perceptions of procedural justice. And notice, when we're talking psychology, what we're really talking as much as anything is people's perceptions. So, if we believe that both sides have fought the good fight and the outcome is decided by the jury, then we think that the system, that the, what went on was more fair. And that's kind of uh, the way that Americans kind of approach that, right? But, at the same time, this may lead to the prevalence of plea bargaining. That is, I'm afraid that the case might not go my way. No one's trying to discover the truth. The case might not go my way. I might lose, so isn't it better if I just cop a plea and get the hell out of Dodge? That is, take two years instead of 20. More on plea bargaining later as well. And now the fourth dilemma. Legal experts depend on what's been decided in the past. It's called stare decisis. Let the decision stand, right? That is, what did the last court who had a similar case rule? How did they rule? And we should probably rule in the same manner. That is, we apply previous decisions to new cases, right? Psychologists, on the other hand, right, what do we do? We conduct experiments. We, we, we look for correlations, and then we turn those correlations into testable hypotheses, and we experiment in the laboratory, and, and we're evidence-based. So highly influential cases for the legal system, stare decisis, highly individual decisions and opinions, right, impact the future decisions. Plessy versus Ferguson, the example we'll use. In 1896, guy wants to get on a rail car. The deal is, he's a black man. And they say, you may not sit in this car, this rail car, because this is a white car. You have to go sit in the black car, right? And, and he says, you know, well, I don't want to sit in the black car because it's not as good. And, and it goes to court, and what happens is, in Plessy versus Ferguson, the ultimate decision is, says, it's okay to segregate black and white as long as they have equal facilities. 
So if both rail cars are equal quality, then it would be okay to tell the black people to get in their car and, and leave the white people in their car. That In fact, the difference did not imply inferiority. Now, stare decisis. Let's take a case that is 54 years later. Sweat versus painter. Separate would be unequal. What's happening at the University of Texas Law School? They say, well, you can't come in because you're a black man. You can't come into the University of Texas Law School because it is, in fact, a, a white school, so you stay out. And, and, and he says, but, but, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson, we're, what we'll do, hey, we're going to create a black law school. So now our white students will go to the white law school, and our black students will go to the new black school. And the court said, no, you can't do that. Because there's no way that the black law school will be equal to the white law school. So it will denote inferiority. Right? Now, let's go to McLaren uh, versus Oklahoma. And this is another law school case. So a guy wants to go to law school, and they say, hey, Mr. Black Man, this is a white law school. He says, yeah, but I, I can go here. And they say, fine. So what they do is they actually put a railing in the classroom. Right? And all the white people are sitting on this side of the railing, and then the black man has to sit on the other side of the railing. And the courts go, no, you can't do that. That's not an equal experience. You're creating an unequal experience of the law school for these people. It's not allowed. But Plessy still stood, right? Separate but equal is still okay. Those cases were rejected on the basis of it was unequal. And 58 years later, it's the Warren Court, right? A relatively liberal court, Brown versus Board of Education. Right? They reversed it. It was a long, slow process. But what they said is segregating black children is inherently unequal. Right? So there's a plethora of social psychological evidence to support Justice Warren's opinion. And that is that when you treat someone differently, then they have an unequal experience. So at that point, segregation kind of fell apart. Although segregation is alive and well in today's world. So the fourth dilemma with psychologists, psychologists are a wacky bunch, experimental social psychologists especially. We do systematic analysis and testing. We do hypothesis-based testing. But as a social psychologist, especially as an experimental social psychologist, if you ask me, hey, what's this person going to do? I'm going to go, I don't know. Because I don't know about this person, and I'm not going to make a prediction on this individual. Now, if you ask me, what is the probability that this person will rule guilty in this case? I can say things like, well, based on my research, about 65 of my participants would rule guilty under this circumstance. So odds are he will rule, rule guilty. But notice, I can't give you an individually tailored decision because we don't work that way. I never look at anyone's individual data as a social psychologist doing research. I take the average of this group and the average of that group, and I compare those two averages to see if there's a statistically significant difference. But I don't deal with individuals. So social psychologists especially, and all experimental psychologists basically operate in a realm of probabilities. And that's what the dice are there for, to demonstrate the probabilities. So please remember the four dilemmas. They're fair game throughout the course. Yes, they are, in fact, that important. And I'm going to break here because I need a little more time to explain our first so assignment. So let's talk about you. our first assignment, exploring the dilemmas, because they are so important. This is homework one. That's the designation. And this is the application of the four dilemmas. So each team member pick a dilemma. No duplicates, please. So I think we got a design for four people per team. You're going to negotiate between yourselves. So you're going to have to find some system to communicate with each other and some way to use shared documents. That's on you, but you guys are technologically astute, so I got confidence you can pull that shit off, right? Explain the dilemma conceptually. So each one gets to pick a dilemma, explain it. Provide an applied situation example of the dilemma. I got an example for you in a minute, right? And then take a position on the dilemma. Okay? And then provide an example of the opposite view to a teammate's position. So basically, you have four teammates, right? Each one picks a dilemma. Each then explains the dilemma with an example and picks their position on it. Then, as a teammate, everyone then looks at everyone's work and then negotiate between yourselves and then comment 
on a person. So every dilemma is presented by each team, a dilemma is presented by a team member, and then a response to that dilemma by a different team member. But all four, all the way across, right? So your team needs to assign a different dilemma to each team member. Each team member needs to respond to another team member's dilemma, putting it as simply as possible. Let me give you an example here. I want to talk about Butterball. Yeah, it's one of my cats, I know. I'm going to use ridiculous examples throughout the course. Butterball chose the first dilemma, individual rights versus the common good. Butterball describes a dilemma conceptually in a short paragraph, explains what the dilemma is, what it means, and then Butterball, in the second part, right, applies the dilemma to the situation of wearing a helmet while driving a motorcycle. I have an individual right to drive helmetless. Because no one can tell me if I should wear a helmet or not, right? Other people, uh, so, but then three, as supporting the common good is reducing the medical cost burdens for the society, right? So what Butterball is saying is, look, you know, people should wear helmets because if they don't wear helmets, they have massive brain injuries and it costs society a fortune to pay for their medical care, right? Now, Sancho, on the other hand, my other cat, responds by explaining the opposite position, that wearing a helmet may hinder the rider's ability to hear traffic and therefore makes it more difficult for the rider to avoid threats, thus increasing the likelihood of an accident. Basically, what we're doing is just exercising our critical thinking muscle. I want you to be able to take a strongly held opinion that you have about an issue and then I want you to be able to understand that someone has a strongly held position that's opposite to yours. And that's where we're going to leave it at this time. I'm not, I'm not saying that one position is better than the other, or one is right, or one is wrong, or they're both right, or they're both wrong. I'm not going there with that. What I'm saying is there are two different points of view. Now, I'm a scientist. You give me the two different points of view, and I can figure out how to test, how to gather data that provides support for one position and refutes the other position. That's what science is, is about, and we'll explore that in coming assignments. Okay? So I hope this is straightforward. And remember, if you have questions, what are you going to do? And what should you be doing anyway? You should be coming to our weekly Zoom session. You should be Johnny on the spot. You should have the lectures under your belt. You should have the reading under your belt prior to the Zoom session for that week. You should have reviewed the assignments and any questions you have about the material, any questions you have about the assignments, then you ask them at that point in time. Make sense? All right. Check it out. We got lecture one under our belt. And who is that? But Cerebellum. And she wants you to kick ass in this course as much as I do. Cerebellum's a pretty wacky cat. She came as kind of an adolescent into the backyard. My neighbor Wilson and I were building a picket fence. We got saws going. We got nail guns going. We're making all the noise in the world. And what does Cerebellum do? She just walks up as this stray juvenile and says, hey, I like you and I want you to adopt me. And if you're using a circular saw or a drill, it doesn't matter. She's a wacky, wacky cat. So say hey to Cerebellum. Why do we call her Cerebellum? What is the Cerebellum? Yeah, it's that area of your brain back there. They called it the cerebellum because that's Latin for little brain. And she looks like an adult cat that we have in our home called brain. But she was littler. So we called her little brain. But that's cerebellum. I know. That's freaking ridiculous. You guys have a great day.